Good evening. If you would take your insert and find that one that's number 18 titled, Come We That Love the Lord. And if you can join me in standing for this opening, I would appreciate that if you're able. join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much uh, for the fact that we are yours, that you have claimed us, and uh, you have us on this great journey where we are one day going to be perfectly reunited, reunited with you. All sin, all suffering, all sorrow, all of those things will be left behind, and what a great praise that is to you and to our blessed Savior, um, who we will celebrate tonight, that great and incredible sacrifice that he has made on our behalf. We thank you for the Lord's table and what it represents. I ask that you would please bless us as we go through the remainder of this hour, and may all that we do glorify you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Number 25, Immortal Invisible.
scripture tonight. Yeah. This would be a good time to do that. We're actually going to finish the David story tonight in 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2. Pastor was praying this morning for the Kaler family. Wes Kaler, Renda's brother, Wes, went in today to have a couple of coronary arteries cleared out, and he died. So Renda's brother, Wes, passed away this morning. Uh, there'll be a funeral late this week, maybe here. Uh, the last funeral that Interlakes Baptist Church had happened here. I wouldn't be surprised, so we'll, we'll uh, let you know uh, more when we know more. Uh, but again, pray for the Kaler family, and uh, of course, Renda was a Kaler. So um, certainly keep the, the family in your prayers this week. First Kings chapter 1. I want to read with you all of chapter 1 and the first 12 verses of chapter 2 because it is then that we find Solomon on David's throne. And then I want to take just a moment here tonight and think with you about some of the, the highlights of the David story. So we've made our way all the way through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, catching the, the story of Samuel, the story of Saul, the story of David, and now we finish up David's story in 1 Kings chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. Now King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms that my lord the king may be warm. Sounds like a, like a plan that's going to succeed, right? I don't, know about, I don't know if all of you old men think that sounds like it's going to be a, a real workable plan. So, verse 3, they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. So she is indeed just there for warmth. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Who was, his, who was Adonijah's daddy? David. Yes, another of David's sons. He exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? He was a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. But Zadok, the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shimei and Rei and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fattened cattle by the serpent's stone, which is beside Enrogel. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaiah, or the mighty men, or Solomon, his brother. There's a bit of intrigue here in the family of David already. Then Nathan, verse 11, said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? And David, our Lord, does not know it. Therefore, now come, let me give you advice, that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go in at once to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord the king, swear to your servant, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me? and he shall sit on my throne. Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still speaking with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Now the king was very old. And Abishag the Shunammite was attending to the king. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king, and the king said, What do you desire? She said to him, My lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, 
He shall sit on my throne. And now behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord the king, did not know it. He has sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king. Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army, but Solomon your servant he has not invited. And now, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will come to pass, when my lord the king sleeps with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be counted offenders. Now while she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet, as previously arranged, came in. And they told the king, in verse 23, here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, my lord the king, have you said, Adonijah shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down this day and has sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. And behold, they're eating and drinking before him and saying, Long live King Adonijah, but me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon he has not invited. Has this thing been brought about by my lord the king? He knows the answer to that question already. Has this been brought about by my lord the king, and you have not told your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Then king David answered, call Bathsheba back in. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore, saying, as the lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by Yahweh the God of Israel, saying, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so will I do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground and paid homage to the king and said, May my lord King David live forever. King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king. And King David said to them, Take with you the servants of your lord and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. Then let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. You shall then come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Now Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my lord the king, say so. As Yahweh has been with my lord the king, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my lord King David. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. There Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. Now Adonijah heard this. Verse 41. Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished feasting. And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, What does this uproar in the city mean? While he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar the priest, came, and Adonijah said, Come in, for you're, wor you're a worthy man, and you bring good news. Jonathan answered Adonijah, No, for our lord King David has made Solomon king, and the king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they had him ride on the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet had have anointed him king at Gihon, and they've gone up from there rejoicing so that the city is in, in an uproar. This is the noise you've heard. Solomon sits on the royal throne. Moreover, the king's servants came to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, May your God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours and make his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. 
The king also said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. Then all the guests of Adonijah trembled and rose, and each went his own way. And Adonijah feared Solomon, so he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Why did he do that? Because he thought, there's no way they'll kill me while I'm holding on to the horns of the altar. It's like, you wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? Then it was told Solomon, behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon. For behold, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Solomon said, if he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. He came and paid homage to King Solomon. And Solomon said to Adonijah, go to your house. When David's time to die drew near, chapter 2, verse 1, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, And with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you also know what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals on his feet. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. But deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite. Let them be among those who eat at your table, for with such loyalty they met me when I fled from Absalom your brother. And there is also with you Shimei the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahurim, who cursed me with a grievous curse on the day when I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now therefore, Solomon, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do to him. You shall bring his gray head down with blood to Sheol. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Let's reflect for a minute. Highlights in the life of David. Go ahead, Al. Killed a giant. Yeah, killed a giant, cut off his head. Yeah, killed him with a smooth stone. We'll see next week in uh, Judges chapter 12, I think. Maybe it was last week in Judges 11. Now I've totally forgotten. Um, five cities of the Philistines that the Israelites did not take, take care of in the conquest. And those Philistines will continue to give Israel trouble, even down to the time of David. Killed a giant. Highlights in the life of David. Larry? He did. Yeah, David sinned big, did he not? And yet God still uh, forgave him. Even took the penalty that you would have expected for having murdered Uriah away. Not that that was without consequence in his family. Phyllis? Yeah, his anointing as king. Who anointed him? Samuel did. Yep. God's man. God's chosen man. Does that mean Saul was not God's chosen man? Not sure, huh? It's hard to know. But certainly the the Davidic line will continue to supply kings to Judah for centuries. Rose, is that your hand I saw? Joy. 
He refused to what? He did, didn't he? So Saul had done him wrong over and over again. And yet David still respected the Lord's anointed so much that when he had opportunity to kill Saul, he chose not to. He did sometimes do kind of covert things, cutting the hem off of his garment just to show or to steal his water jug, just to show that he could have killed him even though he chose not to because he had respect for the Lord's anointed. Nathan, was that a hand? He was yeah, a man after God's own heart. That gives hope for us sinners, doesn't it? Alex? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even when Ziklag was destroyed. So there was a period of time in David's life when he was running from Saul, and he ran and allied himself with the Philistines. And he made this sort of fakey impression that he was out on, on raids and he was taking care of the enemies of the Philistines. Really what he was doing is taking care of the enemies of the Israelites. But eventually the gig was up and the, the city of Ziklag was destroyed and he, he and his men paid a tremendous price for that. Other highlights in the life of David? He did. He did, kept his promises, took care of Mephibosheth, who was a grandson of Saul, son of Jonathan. Yeah, he was, a, he was a man who was loyal to his promises. And it seems funny to me at the end of the story of David's life here that he says to Solomon, there's a few people that have done me wrong and I've chosen to sort of ignore it. I want you not to ignore them. I want you to take them out, put out a hit on them. Ken? He did. Yeah, he survived the coup attempt by Absalom. We weren't really sure in the midst of that how it was going to turn out. We weren't sure if Absalom was going to win the day. He was a, he, he was a, he was a good-looking man. The people were following after him. and I really wasn't quite sure in the midst of that reading who was, who was going to end up being the, the one on the throne at the end of the day, but David survived that. The trouble with that is that Absalom was killed by David's own people. And, and David would then, yeah, David would then cry out, Absalom, Absalom, my son. And, he, and David's own people would give him a hard time for, for crying over the death of a son who had rebelled against him. What, what would you expect a father to do? Anything else? Highlights in the life of David? We've spent weeks and weeks here. Go ahead, Phyllis. Yes. Yes. True friendship. Yeah, these are... These are uh, men who had found in one another uh, a real friend, which doesn't make any sense because David was being chased after by Jonathan's, Jonathan's father. And Jonathan recognized that David was going to be the one to follow Saul and the throne of Israel. And that meant Jonathan would not follow his father. Yet those two were loyal to one another right to the bitter end, weren't they? It's a beautiful friendship to see. Larry? Yeah. No. They've not always been on the up and up in America either. I've been uh, slogging my way through Ron Chernow's biography of Alexander Hamilton. I'm about 600 pages in now. I'm finally making some progress. Um, but I didn't know anything about Alexander Hamilton. I've not seen the musical. I, I have no idea whether that's worth seeing. Uh, I'm reading the book. And the, just the way that you watch Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Hamilton, who's really a, an early mover and shaker in the, in the development of this country's governmental structure, to watch the intrigue that happens among those men where they're often playing just like Absalom and David or Adonijah and Solomon. It looks, there's a, I, I love the way that Solomon's mother goes in and makes her plea and they've arranged for Nathan the prophet to come in. It's just, that kind of stuff was happening uh, two and a half thousand years, or three and a half thousand years ago and 250 years ago as well. Anything else concerning the life of David? 
Yeah. He was. Yes. Yes. He's a he's a shepherd boy from near Bethlehem without advanced military training and yet he was God's man and therefore yeah he was able to to accomplish great things early on in his in his uh, public life the people of the city would cry out of Jerusalem would cry out Saul has killed his thousands but David has killed his 10,000s which really irritated Saul Sir Yes. Yes, failing and then crying out to God for forgiveness. You know, it's hard for us not to read Psalm 51 and see not just David's sin, but to see my sin. Yeah, against you and you only have I sinned, oh God. Great model for us. Thanks for spending time with me in the life of David. I'm not really sure where we're headed next week, but we'll find a, I, we're going to depart from, we're not going to continue in First Kings. We'll, we'll uh, figure it out between now and then. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. All right. For our next song, let's look at number 365, Close to Thee. you to stand with me again if you are able. We'll sing the last one before the throne of God above.
We're going to celebrate the Eucharist together tonight. The what? The Eucharist. Does that seem uh, sort of ca Catholicish to you when I call it the Eucharist? We have been this fall and winter considering the celebration that we engage in tonight under various titles. In October, we thought about this as the Lord's Supper or Lord's Table. In November, uh, we thought about it as communion. And uh, here we are tonight, what should have been December's communion. Where were we the last Wednesday in November? On hiatus. So uh, we finally get to it here to think about the Eucharist as a term that describes this celebration that we're going to engage in tonight. This comes to us from the gospel accounts. I'll invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. It really is a, a, a great title. It does have sort of sacramental Catholic overtones. And for that reason, we aren't used to calling what we celebrate here the Eucharist. But we will tonight, and you'll see why. Matthew chapter 26 I'll invite you to think with me, beginning or read, follow along with me, beginning in verse 17. Beginning in verse 17 of Matthew 26. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The rabbi or the teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, verse 26, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives." Uh, did you see the Eucharist in this passage? Well, verse 17, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 27, not 17, verse 27. When Jesus had taken a cup, when he had given thanks, that Greek word is eucharistesas. Eucharistesas, do you hear eucharisto there? Eucharistesas is an aorist participle masculine singular aorist participle, of eucharisteo, which means to give thanks. It's the verb that means to give thanks. The Eucharist is the giving of thanks. What did Jesus do when he picked up that cup? He gave thanks. There's our word. Let's take a look in Mark chapter 14. I think we'll see it again here. Mark chapter 14. I'll start a bit later in the in the story this time, we've already seen the instruction. Remember the meal that Jesus and the disciples are sharing together is a Passover meal. As good Jewish people, they participated in that every year, about our Easter time, in terms of the spring of the year. So they were celebrating Passover. We saw that in Mark's, excuse me, in Matthew's gospel. Now just let me see with you uh, the words that come to us about the celebration of that meal, beginning in verse 22 of Mark 14. Mark 14, 22. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. 
Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Did you see our Eucharist in those verses? Verse 23, right? When he had taken the cup, he gave thanks. When he had given thanks, same aorist participle, Eucharist de sas, that uh, you're that Eucharist, part, that, that root in that word, he gave thanks. Thanks. Look with me in Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. I'll begin this time in verse 14. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. And when the hour came, that's the hour of the Passover meal, when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. So much for that uh, painting you see of Jesus and the disciples in the Last Supper, and they're all sitting on one side of a table in chairs, uh, not culturally accurate. So they're reclining at table, laying there at the table with maybe sort of on, if you can imagine a low table and you're lying maybe on your left side, on your left elbow, and you're eating with your right hand, feet sticking out behind you. That's the impression I have. Not exactly what I'm used to seeing in the pictures. Uh, when the hour had come, he reclined at table, verse 14, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he's betrayed. And they began to question one another which one of them it could be who was going to do this. Did you see our Eucharist word here? Twice, thank you, Larry. Uh, in verse 17, here he takes a cup before the bread, which is unique to Luke. He takes a cup and he gives thanks. Same word, same aorist participle, Eucharistesas. And then again in verse 19, this time in relationship to the bread, when he had given thanks. Again, the same aorist participle of Eucharisteo. One more passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We could perhaps try to find the institution of Passover in John's gospel, but it's not quite as neat and tidy as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. I'll begin in verse 23. The earlier part of this passage is where Paul is reminding the Corinthians that they've been abusing this celebration of communion, the Lord's Supper, of what we're tonight calling the Eucharist. They'd been abusing that, not waiting on one another. And then he, Paul reminds the Corinthians of what he's received. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Did you see our Eucharist word in this passage? In verse 24. So he takes the bread in verse 23, and when he had given thanks, same aorist participle, same form, when he had given thanks, then he gave it to them, broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. So Eucharist comes from a Greek verb, Eucharista, which just means to give thanks. It's what Jesus did in Matthew 15 or in Mark 8. It's what Jesus did in those two passages as he prepared to distribute seven loaves and a few small fish to 4,000 plus people. He gave thanks. It's, again, what Jesus did, recorded for us in John 6, as he 
uh, got ready to distribute five loaves and two fish to 5,000 plus. He gave thanks. It's what the cleansed Samaritan leper did in Luke 17. Do you remember that? Jesus healed 10 lepers. And he sent them off to show themselves to the priest. And one of them came back to do what? That's our word. Yeah, eucharisteo, the one came back and Jesus' question was, where are the other nine? Well, he sent them off to see the priest. They did not come back, but that cleansed Samaritan leper gave thanks. It is what the Pharisee, in contrast to the tax collector, did in Jesus' parable in Luke 18. Remember that Pharisee who stood there and said, Lord, I thank you that I was not um, made to be like other men, he says, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. So that Pharisee was thanking God, same word. It's what Jesus, when he prepares to raise Lazarus from the dead in John 11, when Jesus says, he lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And he didn't pray so that the Father would hear him. He prayed so that the people around him would hear. We heard about this Wednesday night as we considered uh, public prayer just a little bit. This verb, eucharisteo, uh, and its related noun and adjectives show up in the New Testament, if I've counted it right, 55 times. Now, we have looked at all of the passages, or at least talked about all of the passages where that word is used in the Gospels tonight, and, of course, 1 Corinthians 11 as well. Now it's time for me to ask you a question. For what is Jesus giving thanks as he breaks the bread and prepares to pass the cup? We saw this in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and in 1 Corinthians. Jesus having given thanks. What's he giving thanks for? There are, well, there might be wrong answers, but there are a multitude of right answers tonight. Help me out. So Jesus, as he prepares to distribute those elements, gives thanks. Mike, what's he giving thanks for? Giving thanks to the Father for what? For the bread and the cup. Okay. Gerald? Giving thanks to the Father for the future sacrifice that he's going to make. It's going to cost him. It is going to cost him dearly. Not just his earthly life, but it'll cost him fellowship with the Father as he hangs on the cross. He'll pray in the garden. Father, if there's any way, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. Yeah, I'll buy that. What else? Charlene, what's he thanking? What's he thankful for? Okay, for the three or three and a half years that he spent with those men who are going to be the foundation of the church. These men who are going to record not just the Gospels, but all of these stories about uh, Jesus' life and ministry, and they're going to carry that, with the exception of Judas, they're going to carry that forward eventually once they get their act together again, once they get done fishing. They're going to carry that forward, and you and I are the recipients of that. Yeah, thanking God for the time that they'd had together. What else, Nathan? Yeah. Yeah, uh, when he, uh, well, I don't, I, I, you may be right. I thought I caught, I thought I caught in my discussion all the examples of where Eucharist shows up in the Gospels. But when Jesus, I'm thinking about the two men on the road to Emmaus. I'm guessing it must, I think maybe Eucharist was not there, but it's in the breaking of the bread with those men, interestingly enough, that they finally recognize who he is. He did in John 6 and in Matthew 15 and Mark, I said it, but I've forgotten, 8 maybe. Yes, when he feeds the four and the 5,000 in both cases, yeah, as he prepares to distribute the few loaves and a couple of fish, yeah, he gives thanks, exactly. Phyllis? Yeah, giving thanks for what his actions and the symbolism will, meet, will mean going forward for the church. He says to his disciples, holding this bread in his hand, says, this is my body. 
they're saying to themselves, no, I see your body. It's holding the bread. Yeah, this represents my body. And he holds the cup and says, this is my blood which is poured out for you. No, your blood hasn't been poured out yet. It's still coursing through your veins and arteries. Yeah, the symbolism of these elements that you and I will hold in our hands tonight. So giving thanks for what that means for the church going forward, for us, month by month. Other answer to the question? For what is he giving thanks? Yeah, through those elements. Yeah. It is. Yes. Yes. Yeah, what's being pictured for us here tonight is not just little pieces of bread and cups of grape juice. Well, that's true. That's what they are. But what's being pictured for us is the, is the, is the, the meat of the gospel. Yeah. Which will, through which Christ will build his church. Yeah, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Alex? They are. It was. Yes. Yeah, so the disciples and Jesus are indeed celebrating Passover, which is a time to be thankful for the deliverance that God effected uh, way back when Moses and the Israelites left Egypt 1,500 years before, or a little less. And they'd been doing this. They'd been celebrating Passover year by year by year with thanksgiving. Good. Larry? What do you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There is. Right. There's a whole lot. A whole lot of, a whole lot of what God had, the plan that God had, it, had put into place, had enacted, that now comes to fruition as Jesus celebrates with his disciples this Passover meal. Giving thanks. So it's, it's okay for us to call this the Eucharist, isn't it? You might want to be careful when you go outside of of this room and talk to your friends. Because some of your friends, if you say to them, hey, we celebrated the Eucharist last night, they'll look at you a little bit crooked. Because again, we're not so used to, in our uh, evangelical fundamental circles, calling it that. But it's, it grows right out of these communion texts where Jesus takes in his hand the cup, takes in his hand the bread, and gives thanks. Do we have anything for which to be thankful tonight? Oh, yeah, especially as we reflect upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. Men, will you join me? Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christ did it all, willingly went to the cross, gave his body for us, a perfect sacrifice he met all the requirements. We want to thank you in Christ's name. Amen.
Then Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this symbol that we can uh, look at and take part in. And the, the symbol is the blood, the life coursing through the veins of Jesus Christ's body. We know that this is not truly blood, but it is truly representative of the life that he brought to earth for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And likewise, when Jesus had given thanks, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often in remembrance of me. Thank you. Thank you for participating together with me in the Eucharist. What a joy it is to be able to come together month by month and celebrate again what Jesus Christ did for us. May you go away from here both encouraged and excited to tell others the same thing. Thank you. We're dismissed. <laughs>